You're looking at crime scene photos. You're looking at crime scene photos repeatedly. You're looking at autopsy photos, um, especially if it's children involved, right? That's really, really burdensome. We have a really, at both our office and the state attorney's office, we have a turnover problem. We cannot keep attorneys. We have 38 vacancies of attorneys right now. That means that someone else has more cases. They have more things that they have to put on that shelf. If you can spread that out because we're able to recruit attorneys and keep attorneys, um, th that would be such an imperative way to help the mental health of the attorneys who are doing this work now. Under the U.S. Constitution, the Sixth Amendment, we're all guaranteed the right to have counsel. But who are those attorneys that represent those major crimes? And what is the impact on their lives? I am Robert Asensio. And to my side here is our partner, co-host, retired police chief, military historian, David Magnuson. Hey, brother, how are you? Doing well. How are you? Always great to have you here. Oh, I'm doing so, great. This is going to be a, a great episode. This is important. We have the chief of the criminal division for the 11th Circuit Public Defender's Office. We have with us Damaris Del Valle. So let's get into it, right? Let's get right into it. Let's do it. You're the chief in charge of these cases. We witnessed a whole bunch of major cases play out in the, in the news. I mentioned about the children's murders, right? Yeah. How what how are you how is your office handling this case? What is the impact on your on you and your attorneys? So it's a lot. Um, it's a lot to bear witness to, to see, and to deal with the clients who are charged and accused of these crimes. In the felony unit, we have people on what we call homicide duty. If someone's arrested for a homicide in Miami Dade County and the public defender's office is appointed there's a public defender who will go see them within 24 hours. And, you know, that's the first contact they have with an attorney after what is oftentimes a traumatic event for them as well. And that person has to go and speak to them. Um, they have to find out whatever information we can. Um, there are instances in which we are the ones who have to tell the client because they don't know that their child has passed. Um, and that's really hard. That's, you know, we're lawyers. We're not therapists. But these are the things we deal with because of the kind of work we do. So you're saying a lot of the defendants, people who have been arrested, charged with the crime, don't know? So there will be times that depending on what condition they're in, maybe they were in a state of psychosis when this happened. Maybe they just were not in their right mind. And the last they remember is their child having been alive. And what we know now, because they've been arrested, is that that child has passed. And there have been instances where I've had to tell mothers, your, your child has passed and you are here because you've been arrested for their murder. And that's a lot, right? That's, that is a lot to deal with. And it's taken me quite some time to get as comfortable as one can doing that. Um, but the impact that has when you then see their eyes and you see their face, because what a lot of people, I think, you know, we want to other people who are charged with these kinds of horrendous mm -hmm. crimes. But the truth is, is that they're humans. Um, the truth is that, you know, many of these people love their children. They are just going through things that as things unravel, become more explainable, right? Once we get the experts involved and we get all of the background in the mental health. Um, but in that moment, they don't know, and we have to try to help them understand and walk through that with them. One one question I have, uh, you know, what you just mentioned and, and what you, you're going through in this uh, incident, what you speak of, but how does it reflect back to the specific public defender who he or she may have children of their own, and they have to separate that now? They have to break away from that. Yeah. It's it's really hard for a lot of the people, a lot of the mothers and fathers we have, mm -hmm. because oftentimes they'll say, you know, I, I was on duty recently and we had one of these cases. And my colleague said to me, you know what, I'm glad it's you and not me because those children are the age of my children. And I think to do this kind of work, 
you're an empathetic person to begin with. Sure. And so being able to put yourself in their shoes and then being like, wow, those could have been my children, right? Um, I think that that is really hard and something that we have to learn to cope with. And we're very lucky. Carlos Martinez, the public defender, has done a lot of work to bring in outside resources to help us cope, to give us tools to cope with those sorts of things. But it is part and parcel of this work, and there's no escaping that. So real quick, this is this is not about being light on crime. This is conversation is centered around gaining a better understanding of who our public defenders are and the impact of secondhand trauma. So I had read in um, one of the law reviews, actually Fine Law, that roughly 37% of the public defenders nationwide suffer from some form of burnout due to the stress, anxiety, and secondhand trauma. So what is it like for a public defender, attorney, to get a case file, begin to examine? Can you give us a little quick overview? Yeah, yeah. So one of the first things, you know, when we first get an arrest form, we usually get some sort of limited discovery, maybe an arrest form. And this will be pre-filing of the charges. But even after we've got a bit more discovery, you go through that. But one of the primary things you do is you meet with this client. Because what you know, and especially in these serious cases, they're in custody. They're being held. Um, you'd be shocked at the number of people who have no prior arrests that find themselves in these situations with these serious, serious crimes. And they are scared and they are alone and they don't know how this works. So we prioritize going out to see them. Carlos has made sure, you know, clients who Carlos are- Martinez, Carlos Martinez, the public defender. The public defender has made sure that if someone is arrested and they are in custody, they are going to be seen by an attorney as soon as possible. And so that's your first job, right? Because I think what we see and what's so ingrained in what we do is these clients are human beings. They are as human as you. They're as human as you. They're as human as me. They may have done something that we could never imagine doing, but that doesn't make them any less human. And so we want to make sure that they understand that they have someone who's on their side, someone who is going to represent them and who's going to work for them and who cares about them as a human being. So we go and we see them and we have these difficult conversations. And as you can imagine, they're meeting a stranger. They've been appointed an attorney. They don't know who this person is. They didn't hire this person. So it's really important that from the beginning, we build that relationship and we make them understand that, you know, our office has amazing attorneys and amazing resources that are going to work as hard as we can to help this person for whatever resolution that might be, however this might end. Um, and then you go back and now you're doing investigation. You're getting more of the discovery. You're getting more evidence. You're looking at crime scene photos. You're looking at crime scene photos repeatedly. You're looking at autopsy photos. The frequency with which, you know, I think I knew when I went into this line of work that was going to happen. But it's one thing to say I'm going to see an autopsy photo and another thing to see the autopsy photos, um, especially if it's children involved, right? That's really, really burdensome. And you carry that with you over and over again. And I really like your shelf example. I think that's, you know, you put stuff on. We have a really, at both our office and the state attorney's office, we have a turnover problem. We cannot keep attorneys. And Carlos has worked hard lobbying the legislature to try to get an increase in pay because we know that the more resources we have, the more attorneys we can hire. We have 38 vacancies of attorneys right now. Those cases that they would handle, those things on that shelf aren't just not there. That means that someone else has more cases. They have more things that they have to put on that shelf. If you can spread that out because we're able to recruit attorneys and keep attorneys, um, that would be such an imperative way to help the mental health of the attorneys who are doing this work now. You know, you made mention too at one point about the empathy of those charged, but you also were very um, resolute in saying the empathy for the victims as well. Yes. Yes. There's, you know, there's no denying in this line of work, 
you know, we we represent innocent people, but we also represent people who have done this. And the Constitution guarantees the right to good representation, right? Our forefathers understood if the government is going to try to take your liberty, this thing that is so sacred and so sacrosanct, you have to have proof beyond a reasonable doubt. The government has to come with that. And we are the ones who are in court making sure that that happens because no one wants to make mistakes. But the people who have passed, the family members of people who have passed, the victims of sexual assault, and, you know, we can talk about generational trauma. What those victims have suffered is not going to just stay with them. It is going to move on to the next generation. And what, when you start doing this work, becomes not surprising is that our clients have so much generational trauma. They are oftentimes either past victims of really horrendous things, be it sexual assault or neglect or abuse, or they've had that in their family. And we know now with the science that that generational trauma really does change your DNA and it changes what you pass on to the next generation. Um, so yeah, you know, it's, it's from everywhere. It's the victims who are suffering this, their families, and our clients as well. You just mentioned about a balanced system, right? The victims have rights mm-hmm. and you got to pr- protect their rights, but you also have to do, follow through due process of the subjects that get arrested. How many attorneys do you have under your, your, your command, if you will? So in the felony division, we have, oh, I should have this number before I came. We had probably, let's say, there's probably over 100 attorneys in the felony division. And we have specialized units as well, um, behavioral health unit that deals with people as they mm-hmm. come in and have behavioral health problems. But we have 20 divisions in the felony unit that are sort of your every day there's court, there's caseloads. And in those divisions, there's about four attorneys per division. And shortage in your office? It's, I mean, I've, you know, I've got a couple numbers here and it's not just shortage. We're u- losing them younger and younger, mm. right? So it's one thing. We have a great training system, but the hope is that we train them and then we get to reap the benefit of that for a period of time because they stay here. We all know the first time you do something is not going to be the best time, right? Mm. That's not the best example. Um, it's when you've done something over and over and you have the experience. And we're losing people. I mean, fiscal year 2022 to 2023, 79% of the people who left, left with less than five years of experience. Wow. 57% with less than three, right? So we are losing attorneys younger and younger. The state attorney's office had 156 people leave in two years. We had 57 attorneys leave in those same two years. It's both sides, right? We need to retain attorneys in order to for them to know what they're doing. It is not easy, but it becomes easier with experience to handle these things and to know I'm reaching my breaking point. I need to step away. But we're losing people before they get to that stage, which means they can't stay here long enough. And it really is, you know, I, I keep tying it back to salaries, but it really is a huge thing. We can't attract people. We have 50% less applications than we did before. The cost of living is high. We all know that. And we can't retain people and we can't attract people unless we can offer salaries. And it's only through having as many attorneys and resources as we can possibly imagine that we can spread this out because there's no getting away from it. This is the work. Mm -hmm. But the less each individual has to deal with with cases, with more and more cases, the longer they can last. You know the old adage, right? We've heard it, doing more with less. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think and Carlos has been lobbying hard. And we're lucky that the Miami legislatures we have, they, the legislators, both Republican and Democrat, they see that this is important. Good. They get that, you know, they are supportive of this. And, you know, it'd be great if the rest of the legislature realized yeah. it, too. Um but it's it's the turnover. It's a turnover backlog, right? There's yeah. a period of time that we thought this backlog was from COVID. Mm-hmm. Well, no, the truth is at this point, this backlog of cases, we have 14% more felony cases now than we did in March of 2020. And we're dealing with numbers in the thousands, right? That's not just a few. Um, so that backlog is because of the amount of turnover on both sides. I mean, we know what a private attorney Generally, what it costs costs anywhere from a few hundred to most likely five six hundred dollars an hour, if not more, for 
competent attorney. So what's the salary of an attorney coming into the public defender's office, average range? Also, have you ever figured out what that is an hour in comparison to the private sector attorney? So we're aiming for $75,000 a year. That's our okay. goal right now for the legislature. I believe we are starting at it's either 60 or 65. I want to say it's 60. Um, thousand dollars a year. That's just low for an attorney. Period. Um, Is it twenty five bucks an hour? If that, you know, no, I think it's I think it's less than that. When you really factor in the work that's being done, you know, you could do the divide by forty. That's right. It's not a forty hour week, right? right? Yeah. But it's not. It's not a forty hour week when you are in trial. And I can't stress the toll it takes on you. When you're in trial, that is your focus from the moment you wake up till the moment you go to sleep. So let's focus on that. You don't, you don't mind. Let's focus no, no, on, on absolutely. the impact to you, your attorneys, and what you're seeing. Yeah. So, again, I think part of it is the turnover we're seeing. Um, I think we're lucky. You know, we had talked about this. We're in an age where I think it's more okay to talk about mental health and mental health issues. Um, but you are seeing people who are recognizing that they're going through compassion fatigue, right? That's kind of the step right before you hit burnout is the, I'm starting to not care. I'm starting to become hardened. Um, and that's not the mindset to operate in. Mm -hmm. And so when you're in trial and some of these trials, if it's a death penalty trial, it can last months. Um, you know, even a three day trial, that is three days where you are singularly focused on that trial. I mean, I know I speak for many of the attorneys in my office, you go to sleep and you know the minute you wake up, it's brush your teeth, get ready, and get back to preparing because there's no there's no end to that preparing when you're in trial. And it's exhausting. It's physically exhausting. It's mentally exhausting. And, you know, luckily, Carlos has given us ample time. We have ample, you know, annual time and sick time that we can use. And I will tell you that when you get out of trial, you need to use that time. You need to reset. But at the same time, you know that you've got a caseload of other clients who are still relying on you. And so until we can get those caseloads down, we're going to have a hard time, you know, keeping people until we have people that are working here, working here for a long time, able to do it. People leave the public defender's office not because they want to. Oftentimes it's I can't take the combined stress of this job and the fact that I can't afford to yeah. live in Miami. Stressful in itself. You said something yesterday, and in a nutshell, it sort of summed it up. I thought it was it was so wonderful. The goal to extend the career lives of the public defender. Yeah. Extend the career lives. Yes. Yes. And look, we we are we are part of this process to make sure there's not a mistake made, right? Because we know mistakes happen. We know innocent people get convicted. What we want is to make sure that we avoid that as much as possible and that in the instances where it's going to a plea or a resolution, it's a fair one, that our client's humanity is recognized. And the more we can do to help the mental health of the public defenders, the longer we can keep them around, the longer we can have them there. It becomes a little easier the longer you do it, but it also benefits the entire community because you have experienced people who know what they're doing, assuring that this constitutional guarantee is actualized in the courtroom. Not an easy job, but but attorney work and criminal defense attorney work more so. The addiction rate or alcohol abuse rate is pretty high. It, it is across the board in issues of anxiety, depression, alcoholism, substance abuse, suicide. The legal community and the defense community in particular has a much higher rate of those things. Um, and so, you know, again, Carlos has brought in, he brought in Jenny Andrews, who works out of California, and she focused specifically on helping people in indigent defense mm -hmm. learn tools and tricks. And sometimes it's just the recognizing of it, right? I went to her training and just being able to come in and be like, wow, you're putting into words what I've felt for the last 14 years when I'm exhausted and I think I can't do this anymore, but I love this work. It's also that dichotomy of we love this work. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think I, I think we're lucky that we're in a day and age that we can identify it, 
Um, I think my office is lucky to have Carlos, who brings in people like Miss Andrews, the Florida Lawyers Assistance Program, Scott Rogers, who works on mindfulness out of the University of Miami, to give us the tools to deal with this. Um, but I think when you look at those numbers across the board, I mean, there's no denying that the work we do has real mental health impacts on everyone who does it. So, David, we have three minutes left. Any, any like, starting to wrap this thing up? Yeah, you know, the tools. That, that's great to have those tools you can dig your way out but sometimes if you're in that hole the more you dig the, the deeper the hole gets so you're getting all these tools but unless certain things change you know you you're good you're in a good place as to not self-medicate with alcohol and or narcotics right uh you're getting that assistance you need or how to deal with it but the issue still remains it's good to say okay i can work with this i know what to do but that issue is still there. And I think at the end of the day, and at the beginning of the day, that's 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 the concern. And not just for you or the state or the law enforcement, for the entire community. Yeah. Yeah. No, I yeah, and I think, you know, some of the studies they've done, some of the things they say really helps reset is time away. Mm -hmm. But a real time away, which is difficult for a lot of people now because we have our emails on our cell phones and no one wants to be away too long. I, you know, I supervise the felony division, but I specifically directly supervise the supervisors in the felony division and eight of the attorneys in division. And there are things that we as managers have have learned and from these same people of how to manage better, right? I won't email my attorneys when they're on leave. If I say, oh, if I don't send this now, I'm going to forget to send it. I will delay send until after they come back. I don't want them checking their email. Um, because we have such an emphasis on interviewing people in a short period of time if, once they go into custody, if I have an attorney who's on a week vacation, a two-week vacation, which they not only have every right to take, but I need them to take because I want them to come back refreshed and competent and diligently doing the work like the bar requires us to, I say you know, to their division mates, if a client comes in, if they get assigned a case and that person's in custody, tell me so I can do the interview. So that the client is spoken to in the time frame that they should be spoken to. And so my attorney can feel like they can go and take the vacation that they really need. Um, and, you know, those things we've learned from these people that Carlos has brought in. And so I think we continue to learn things that we can all do, that managers can do to help the attorneys, that the attorneys can do to help themselves. Um, but it's not, you know, there's no getting out of this in this line of work. It is what it is. So certainly the justice system does not wait for your personal life. Um, in the last like 10, 15 seconds, can you tell the public in your words, what is it like to be a public defender in today's age? Sure. It is the most fulfilling thing I've ever in my life experienced. It gives you insight into people and humans and it reminds you how amazing it is to be a human being and how complex we are. But it is exhausting and it is stressful. And you need to be able to walk away. You need to have the means to be able to walk away. It is much easier to do this job if you are not also stressing about, can I afford my rent this month? Um, but it is so fulfilling because you have a person and a human being that you are trying to help and you get to know them. And regardless of what they may have done, they are still human and they're still good in them. Wow. Deep. On that note, we've run out of time. I know there's so much more to say. Actually, I hope we can do a field trip. Yeah. Would love so, that. Um, we have been speaking with Damaris Del Valle, the chief of the criminal division for the 11th Circuit Court Public Defender's Office in Miami-Dade County. I have been here with my partner, co-host David Magnuson, to the Millers at Miami's Community News, to our producer behind the scene, Rachel Brummage. We can't thank you enough, but you, the public, the people who will watch this, comment, leave us a line. Thank you. We'll see you next time.